Good morning to those who are joining us. Good afternoon now, actually. Um, we'll just let uh, people join us for a few minutes um, after midday and then we'll get started. Good morning again to or good afternoon again to everybody who's joining us. We'll just leave it till a couple of more minutes um, before we, we kick off the proceedings for the day. So um, I think we might get started. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Margaret Hallard from the Burnett Institute, and it's my absolute delight and pleasure to kick off this um, EC Australia Aboriginal Health Strategy webinar for 2021. Um, for those that aren't aware of EC Australia, EC Australia is a, a major partnership between um, the Burnett Institute with uh, other research organisations, um, government, uh, health services and community, in particular, ABLE and its affiliates and Hepatitis Australia, where we're really aiming to um, really catalyze the, eliminate, um, the work being done to um, eliminate Hepatitis C from Australia and reach um, the, 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 the national and um, WHO goals of Hepatitis C elimination as a public health threat. A critical part of our work is um, for EC Australia is our work by the um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Program, which is led by um, Troy Combo, who I'm going to now um, ask to, to join and do the um, welcome to country. So Troy, over to you, please. Thank you, Margaret, for that introduction. Um, hello, everyone. I'm, my name is Troy Combo. I work for the Burn Institute and also have a dual affiliation with the University of Queensland as Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Program Manager for EC Australia. Um, before we kick off today's event, I'd just like to start by acknowledging um, the traditional owners of the country I'm coming to you on today, um, and that's the Cubby Cubby people on the Sunshine Coast. Um, and also, I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past and present, and any of my colleague, Aboriginal colleagues here today. Um, and as always, I also like to acknowledge my lineage back to my country, which is the picture there of the lovely pandanus tree on the beach in Ballina on um, beautiful Bunjalung country. Um, before we get going, there's one more, I guess, acknowledgement that we, we can't go without, and that's the acknowledgement of the peers. Um, and I'll pass over to Esha Layton from Quinn, um, who's going to give an acknowledgement of the peers and, and the contribution they do and how they enrich the work that we do um, in, in, this, in this space. So welcome, Esha. Thank you, Trey. We acknowledge all the people who have lost their lives to hep C and liver disease over the years. We acknowledge the peers and thank, you, thank the people with lived experience of hep C 
who give generously and participate in research and their contribution to progressing towards hep C elimination. Real people and real lives that gives meaning to the work we are doing today. Thank you very much for that, Esha. Um, and I think all of us here today, we cannot understate the, you know, the role that the peers play um, in regards to the work that we do in this space. So thank you very much for that acknowledgement. Um, just on a little bit of housekeeping rules, um, the presenters today will um, do presentation. There'll be um, no time for questions directly after the questions, but you can join us at the end for a um, panel discussion um, where you'll be able to pop some questions into the, the question bar down the bottom of um, your screens. Um, the session has been moderated, so we may decline questions and comments that are not professional or respectful to our presenters um, and participants here today. I um, just really need to highlight in this space with COVID-19 um, that this is a scientific webinar on hepatitis C. Um, and if you have any feedback or concerns about other areas of um, the Burnett's work, please view our policies on the Burnett website or write to us at info at burnett.edu.au. Um, I know there's a lot of people out there um, that are in the audience today that like to use Twitter. Um, so you can use EC Australia's Twitter handle at EC underscore AUS. Um, and there's some hashtags there that um, we've recommended that you might want to use throughout the day. And as our partners present, our partners, staff present, um, there's, there's their Twitter handles are also down the bottom where you can tag them into um, their presentations if you'd like to make comment. It'd be really good to try to get some uh, momentum and a little bit of traction today on Twitter. Um, in regards to um, really driving the inequities within hepatitis C in Aboriginal communities, um, but also some of the great work that's been done across the country to do that. So um, thank you for that. And the next slide, please. I think we're gonna move straight into the presentations. Um, our first presenter is Science Pro Pro Professor Greg Daw from the Kirby Institute. Um, Greg's gonna give us a presentation today on Australia's first um, progress report towards hepatitis C elimination in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Um, we're presenting on a, a large data linkage project that's been undertaken at the Kirby Institute. So without um, any further waiting, um, please make welcome Professor Greg Daw. Thanks very much, Troy, and thanks, Margaret. Um, and it's great to have the opportunity to present today. I'll just uh, share my slides. Okay, so that's come up okay, Troy? Fine, mate. Okay, so firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that I live and work on Gadigal and Vidigal lands in the eastern suburbs of Sydney and Aurora Nation and pay my respects to elders past and present. And um, it's a great opportunity to present the progress towards hepatitis C elimination among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia. In terms of the preparation of the report, I'd really like to acknowledge the enormous work by Sahar Bajis, who's really has been instrumental in putting this report together. Um, there's lots of other people to acknowledge. Uh, we had a great uh, project team at the Kirby Institute um, that was involved in the project. We had a lot of data contributors uh, through many, many projects, data sets. Um, we also had a Kirby Institute Aboriginal reference group that Rob Monaghan uh, chaired that was really valuable, had several meetings during the process to provide oversight and input into um, report. Uh, the Kirby Institute BBV SDI Surveillance Committee uh, also was involved in preparation of the report. And we had a stakeholder workshop uh, meeting last month uh, with a range of stakeholders uh, being pre present. Uh, a really valuable sort of opportunity to present the draft findings from the report and get feedback and, and also to work on key recommendations. So I'll present some of those towards the end. Um, should also acknowledge that the work was supported by a grant from the Australian Government Department of Health. Okay, so the report aims were threefold. Uh, we wanted to provide an account of progress towards hepatitis C elimination among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people by using measurable indicators, both in terms of service coverage targets and also impact targets. We also, for the first time, wanted to estimate a cascade of care, including the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people living with hepatitis C at the end of 2020. And this is a, a really sort of key component of the report. And importantly, we wanted to propose strategic priorities and recommendations for moving forward. 
In terms of the report itself, obviously, we wanted to align the report somewhat in terms of the global health sector strategy on viral hepatitis and the, the targets that have come from that, uh, the fifth national hepatitis C strategy, and also the fifth national Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander bloodborne viruses and sexually transmissible infection strategy. And obviously, these strategies are being updated, and the next strategies will be rolled out uh, soon as well. So on to the key findings. So we'll start with service coverage targets. Um, we're looking at hepatitis C testing and diagnosis, and this data comes from the annual needle and syringe program survey, which is a surveillance mechanism that's led from the Kirby Institute that involves 50 NSP sites around the country um, and is undertaken over a week or two weeks uh, across those sites, generally in October each year. It's been up and running for more than two decades. Um, we do self-reported uh, behavioural information, as well as we ask about testing uh, of hepatitis C, and we look at dried blood spot samples for HIV, hepatitis C antibody, and also more recently, hep C RNA. So when we ask about uh, whether people have been tested ever, you can see uh, no significant difference between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander participants and non-Indigenous participants across the years in the more recent period of the survey. And that's in terms of ever tested and also in terms of being tested for either antibody or RNA over the previous uh, 12 months. So some slight differences, but really no significant sort of gaps there in terms of testing. So at least from that data source, testing looks pretty comparable. Uh, we also have data from the Ethos Engage project, and that is an observational cohort that's led through the Kirby Institute here. Uh, where we enrol people through drug treatment and NSP sites um, across several jurisdictions, uh, a large number in New South Wales, but other jurisdictions involved. And we've had two ways of recruitment, the first in 2018 to 2019, and the second in latter part of 2019 through to mid 2021. Uh, over a thousand people uh, in both of those waves. And again, here we're asking about testing for uh, hepatitis C, but in, in this case, we're talking about testing for hep C RNA. So in terms of ever tested for hep C RNA, uh, no significant difference between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander participants um, who make up uh, more than 20% of the participants uh, in this cohort. So in terms of ever tested hep C RNA or testing over the previous 12 months, uh, pretty comparable rates of reported testing for hep C RNA. Looking at data from the ATLAS, uh, Sexual Health Surveillance Network, and this is looking at testing for hepatitis C antibody. So the first two data sources I showed you are clearly in high-risk populations, so people who inject drugs or people who are receiving drug dependent dependency management. This is obviously in a broader population, so you would anticipate lower levels of testing. But you can see a pretty stable proportion of people being tested through these services each year from 2016 through to 2020. So 11 to 13% of people reporting hepatitis C antibody testing. Now we move to, uh, importantly, hepatitis C treatment uptake. Uh, we have a a large uh, data linkage project that we've been running in New South Wales for some years where we link all hepatitis C notifications and there's about 120,000 of them uh, to several administrative data sets, uh, including the PBS for hep C treatment uptake and also MBS for hep C RNA testing. We wanted to look at a more recent diagnosis. So here we're looking at those people notified. So their first diagnosis of hepatitis C in 2016 and 2017. Uh, and whether they had been linked to treatment. Uh, within that group, we estimated about 3,500 uh, people, uh, and about a quarter of those people uh, were self-identified through the different surveillance systems and administered data sets as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. And you can see here quite a significant gap. So 44% were treated over the period 2016 through 2018. So these are the diagnoses for that two-year period, but we're looking at treatment over the three year period. Um, and that compared to in the non-Indigenous population, 65%. Uh, if you look at the broader sort of notifications, the gap is not as large, uh, but we wanted to really look at the more recent notifications to see whether there was some issues in terms of linkage to care and treatment. And clearly that does appear to be uh, an issue there. Um, going back to the annual needle and syringe program survey, um, and just to sort of highlight, we 
enrol about 2,000 uh, participants each year. Some years lower, and particularly 2020 was a, a low year. In fact, Victoria wasn't part of the survey in 2020 uh, for COVID-related reasons, uh, but some years have been above 2,500. Uh, in that survey, um, we asked whether people have been treated with hepatitis C. And you see very small numbers, as you would imagine, in the pre-DA period, uh, around 10% of people reporting hepatitis C treatment, and this encouraging increase in terms of reported hep C treatment. But there is a significant uh, gap between the reported treatment among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander participants uh, and the non-Indigenous populations that's emerged, uh, particularly uh, you can see over more recent years. So you know, again, somewhat sort of concerning that we're not linking people to uh, care and treatment as effectively. How are we doing in terms of treatment outcomes? Um, so we all know that DA therapies have this incredibly high curative potential, uh, but importantly, we wanted to look at this in the context of Australian treatment. So we set up the REACH-C observational study uh, that enrolled more than 10,000 participants who'd been commenced on DA therapy from 2016 uh, onwards. Um, we had just under uh, 1,000, so 915 uh, people that identified as Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander in that sample population. And in terms of their treatment outcomes, in terms of the, what we call the per protocol, so this is people that had information available for the 12 week post-treatment assessment of cure, uh, almost exactly the same and very high treatment out outcomes in terms of cure. So 94 to 95% uh, cure rates in terms of the total period, really no significant difference, 2016, 2017, and then through to 2018, 2019. So incredibly encouraging that we get people on the treatment, we get them through treatment, and we have a, an assessment for cure. We're seeing that the large majority, if not the vast majority of people are being cured. This is also some data that we've got from the Stop C project. That was a treatment prevention project that was undertaken in four New South Wales prisons. Um, and we treated over 300 people within that project. And again, quite a significant proportion, unfortunately, given that it's a prison-based project, were Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. Um, but we can see the treatment outcomes in the Stop C project, again, in those individuals that had post-treatment assessment undertaken, uh, very, very similar and very high in terms of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander participants and non-Indigenous participants. Okay, moving on to harm reduction. Um, so through the annual needle and syringe program survey, we ask about self-reported risk behaviour, and this marker is receptor syringe sharing in the past month. And you can see this consistently higher proportion, above 20% of the participants that are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, reporting receptive syringe sharing in, in the previous month. And about a, overall, about a 10% higher report uh, compared to the non-Indigenous participants, and clearly that may relate to poor access to harm reduction um, services. Um, and it's something that clearly we need to sort of uh, look at going forward. Um, so what impact have we had uh, in terms of uh, uh, components of both prevention and treatment? Um, we have data, as I said at the outset, in terms of the annual needle and syringe program survey through testing of dried blood spot samples uh, for hep C RNA. So we have a a marker of prevalence of active infection through this survey. Uh, if we go back to the pre-DA period, just over a half of people participating in the survey uh, had active hep C infection. And you can see this incredibly encouraging decline in the prevalence of active infection over the period of time following the advent of the DA rollout uh, in Australia. Um, so if you look at the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander population, 51% down to 21%, which looks great, and it is great. Um, so really good news in terms of a more than halving of the prevalence of active infection. Um, but there is a greater decline in the non-Indigenous population, so 51% down to 14%. So certainly, again, it's sort of a gap opening up there in terms of the, you know, the level of decline or the rate of decline in prevalence of active infection. Here's data from the ACCESS network. This is looking at hep C antibodies, so obviously clearly different to the hep C RNA prevalence. Um, but it's interesting to see that in the period 2014 to 2015, 16 to 18 percent, there may be some suggestion of a decline in hep C antibody prevalence over time, whether that reflects uh, declining sort of incidence 
um, and the access uh, initiative will have further sort of data, I'm sure, in terms of looking at Hep C incidents uh, stratified by Indigenous status going forward. Um, looking at notifications, and clearly Hep C notifications are dependent on levels of testing, and there can be changes, temporal changes in testing. I, I know, for example, that there's been an increase in testing within uh, custodial settings over recent years, and that certainly can have an impact on uh, rates of notification. Uh, but we look, if we look at Hep C notifications, and this is not newly acquired notifications, this is you know, all hepatitis C diagnoses. And if we look at that by Indigenous status and by age group, um, clearly you can see the non-Indigenous groups down here uh, much lower, and also evidence of a decline in notifications um, in non-Indigenous participants, or uh, population, sorry. Uh, and particularly in the sort of younger non-Indigenous uh, population as well, which would be evidence of declining sort of incidence, which is obviously something that we're looking for in terms of uh, driving towards hep C elimination in Australia. However, unfortunately, in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population, you can see there's significantly higher overall notification rate. These are rates per 100,000 population, and the highest rate being in the 25 to 39 year old age group. If you then look a little bit more closely within the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander population at those notification rates and divide by gender as well, we can see it's the male uh, 25 to 39 year old age groups and the male 15 to 24 year old age group that has the highest notification rate. So somewhat higher than uh, the female uh, rates for both of those age groups. So clearly a lot of work to do, particularly among uh, younger um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander males in Australia. Um, we do have some encouraging evidence of impact uh, in terms of treatment scale up on incidence of infection. And this is uh, going back to the Stop C project. Uh, I said that this is a project that was undertaken across four New South Wales prisons, two maximum security prisons, Goulburn and Lithgow, and two medium security prisons, including one female prison, Delwinia, where we were monitoring incidence of hepatitis C um, under a context of stand of care hep C treatment. And then from mid 2017, we had a concerted effort to rapidly scale up therapy across that prison sort of network. You can see here incidence of new hep C infections. In fact, among the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population um, was 15 per 100 person year. So an annual risk of 15%, somewhat higher than the risk in the non-Indigenous participants, I think about eight to nine. But you can see in both those populations, following the scale up of DA therapy, a really encouraging decline in incidence down to around about a 2% annual risk. Um, just to sort of look at the sort of the end of the disease sort of spectrum, uh, this is looking at liver related mortality. We link our notifications, as I said, in New South Wales to a whole range of administrative data sets, including hospitalizations. So we can look at hospitalizations for liver failure or liver cancer. And then we can look at people that have died following those uh, uh, acute ad admissions for those advanced liver disease complications. Um, in the smooth line here, we have the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander liver related mortality. And there does appear to be a trend downwards, which is encouraging you know, following 2015, 2016, when the new therapies became available. Uh, and here in the light sort of gray is the non-Indigenous trend in terms of liver-related mortality. So there's a bit of sort of bubble around here in terms of the, the annual sort of uh, rates. But for both groups, it does appear to be a declining sort of trend, and that's very encouraging, uh, as we would anticipate with the scale up of uh, DA therapy, particularly for people with more advanced disease, taking that up more readily in, in the earlier years. Moving on to one of the major objectives I mentioned was to uh, estimate the cascade of care. Uh, in terms of the number of people living with active hepatitis C infection in Australia. And our estimate is about 21,500 people uh, who are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, uh, were estimated to be living with uh, current or active hepatitis C infection. And that makes up um, about an 18% proportion of the total population in Australia, 117,000 at the end of 2020. This is our estimate from the end of 2015. So the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population, we estimated just under 30,000 at the end of 2015. So these are the people that are being cured. 
and haven't been reinfected or you know, minus the new infections as well. This is the proportion of the people that have current infection that we estimate that have been diagnosed in terms of antibody positivity. This is the proportion of people that uh, have been hep C RNA confirmed. So you can see quite a gap here between the estimate of the number of people, say 21,000, and the estimated number of people that have been RNA confirmed. So we've probably got a you know, nine or even 10,000 in a group of people that require not uh, either antibody diagnosis or RNA confirmation. And this is the number of people that have been treated and cured. And that's inc incredibly encouraging that we've obviously cured uh, know, around sort of 10,000 people um, who are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. Um, just in terms of cascade of care, I think it's really important to sort of look at uh, various sort of data sources and local levels as well. This is data from the At Atlas Sexual Health Surveillance sort of network uh, in terms of the numbers of people ever hepatitis C antibody positive. Uh, the proportion of those people that have received confirmatory hep C RNA testing. And that sort of marries with the previous slide of you know, around a bit over a half have received RNA confirmation. Uh, and this is the proportion that are RNA positive. Obviously, we want to lift this proportion that have received effective sort of uh, diagnostic sort of screening. And we obviously want to reduce this proportion in terms of those that are positive. But we need to sort of uh, monitor these going forward. So in, in conclusion, in terms of the findings, I think we can say that unrestricted access to government subsidised DA therapy for hepatitis C has seen large numbers of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people treated and some declines in hepatitis C related liver failure and mortality. I just showed you the mortality figures, but the same for liver failure. Although hepatitis C testing and diagnosis proportions were high, findings highlight gaps in treatment uptake and harm reduction coverage, including new hepatitis C infections a particular concern among young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men. And Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who inject drugs had higher injecting risk behaviour compared with non-Indigenous people who inject drugs. As I said, we moved on to developing some recommendations that were, uh, that were arising from these findings. And I'll, I won't go through all of them, but we've just selected several to sort of highlight. Um, so the first uh, recommendation is that Aboriginal community controlled health services should be supported to expand harm reduction services, including needle and syringe programs where appropriate, well-planned approaches and workforce education should be developed to facilitate successful implementation. Second recommendation was access to harm reduction, including needle and syringe programs should be expanded in prison settings. This clearly requires political will and support and justice system workforce education. Now, the third recommendation was that targeted cultural education of needle and syringe program workforce should be developed and implemented to address high occurrence of needle and syringe sharing among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander clients. Our recommendation eight was that point of care hepatitis C antibody and RNA testing for people at risk of hepatitis C uh, should be implemented in a variety of settings, including uh, Aboriginal community controlled health services, needle and syringe programs, drug treatment clinics, prisons, mental health services, homelessness services, and mobile clinics. Uh, recommendation 10 was a best practice approach, holistic healthcare addressing other comorbidities, social and cultural determinants of health should be provided by a multidisciplinary team, diverse, flexible, culturally gender and age appropriate models of care should be implemented, including mobile and outreach services. Uh, recommendation 11 was to expand peer work, uh, workforce into the Aboriginal community controlled health service sector and other general practitioner services to support clients with testing and treatment as well as education where appropriate. Uh, recommendation 12, further analyses should be conducted to determine the occurrence of testing and treatment by jurisdiction and service type. And recommendation 13 was further analyses of data gaps should be undertaken, including enhancing data collection of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander identity in surveillance projects. Um, so just to conclude, the uh, final report will be available at the end of this week. A few sort of uh, details to um, tidy up on the report. Um, the key messages are presented as infographics and there'll be an available PowerPoint uh, presentation uh, slide set to download and printed copies will be made available. Uh, just finally, really like to acknowledge the artwork undertaken by Jasmine Sarin. Um, and just to you know, thank everyone that's contributed to this report. It's been a, a great sort of project to be involved in. Uh, it's a pity we sort of left it you know, several years into 
um, elimination to really to put this report together and, and hopefully be a report that we will uh, undertake on a regular basis going forward. So thanks very much, Margaret and Troy. Thanks very much, Greg, for a terrific presentation. As Troy indicated, we'll be taking questions at the end. Thanks also for keeping to time. Troy, you and I didn't workshop this properly as to say who was doing what introductions, but shall I do the next introduction or shall you? I can hand it over uh, to you if you like. You can go ahead. Okay, well, I'm really delighted to, um, to introduce our next speakers. Um, Phoebe Schroeder uh, from Asham and Adam Howie, um, who is the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander National Coordinator for Schools and Community Programs um, with Positive Partnerships. And they will be talking about um, hepatitis C for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health workers delivering training in an online environment, which has been, I think, a, a challenge for all of us. So, so um, thank you, uh, Phoebe and Adam, for joining us today. And over to you. Thanks, Margaret. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for joining us today. So my name is Phoebe Schroeder and I'm Active Hepatitis B Program Manager with ASHAM and I'm joined by Adam Howey. Uh, Adam has a background in health education and custody and juvenile detention. He is also an Associate Lecturer in uh, Aboriginal Health with the University of Wales School of Public Health. And I'll also just mention that this education program that we will be discussing today was developed in collaboration with EC Australia. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the lands on which we're each joining from that unite us. I'm joining today from Gadigal land and Adam is joining from Wurundjeri land. We'd like to pay respects to the elders from all of our lands past and present. So Adam and I will be splitting up today's talk, discussing the process that we went through to develop and deliver online hepatitis C education for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health workers and health practitioners. Um, with time and considerations today, we will keep things fairly high level, but we really encourage you to reach out to us should you wish to discuss anything in more detail. So to start off with a bit of background for the development of this education. So this course came about for three primary reasons. The first being that there's a disproportionate burden of hepatitis C in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Uh, second, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health workers and health practitioners play a vital role in the provision of vital hepatitis services to Aboriginal communities, acting as a connection between community and health services and embedding cultural safety in models of service delivery to improve community engagement and provision of care. And stakeholders identified a lack of appropriate training for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health workers and health practitioners with respect to uh, hepatitis C, which was also confirmed by our course attendees. To develop this course, a steering committee was convened, which included Aboriginal peoples, as well as um, those who work in Aboriginal community controlled health organisations. The steering committee really shaped the learning outcomes, the course program and the format, including the discussion of whether online delivery would be appropriate and provided suggestions for course reviewers and presenters and criteria for attendees and presenters. Um, a quick barrier to note was that due to comparatively low numbers of health workers, and subsequently the reduced capacity that they have, particularly during COVID-19, it was initially a bit difficult to engage a substantial number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health workers and practitioners to be involved in the steering committee and to review the course materials. Uh, as a result, the initial course materials were um, also reviewed by non-Indigenous peoples and had a slightly more Western approach to learning. Um, very important to note is that the committee determined that a pilot course should be delivered with ample time between the pilot and the following course, allowing us time um, to really ensure that learnings from the initial course could be used to improve the curriculum and delivery style. So we did pilot this course in December 2020, and it was done online as a mix of presentation, case discussion, and responding to pre-recorded role plays. I'll pass it across to Adam. Uh, thanks, Phoebe. Uh Ashram, in the development course, consulted with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander stakeholders experienced in monitoring and evaluation to develop a methodology allowing data to be collected using both uh, online surveys and as well as uh, yarding sessions. Uh, we implemented a number of guiding principles uh, to inform this approach of uh, evaluations. So all, our serve, all the surveys involved uh, we avoided exam style questions. Uh, we had a transparent evaluation cycle with questions relevant and meaningful to the community. We always had a community focus on in all the evaluation. Uh, it was a very iterative process. Uh, development of evaluation should be an iterative process and ample time should be provided to implement required changes to course delivery as, as uh, Phoebe uh, just stated. 
and insight generating. Evaluation should identify areas for improvement rather than outlining where the course was effective. Uh, the consultation indicated that yarding circles should be utilised with informal conversations led by identifying, led by individual, individuals identifying as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander who were not directly involved with the delivery of the course. And uh, the participants within the yarning circle uh, should also be uh, compensated. So just moving into uh, the course feedback, the, there was uh, quantitative and qualitative data uh, was extracted uh, following the pilot course. The quantitative data came from surveys collected at three points. Uh, one of the limitations uh, with this data collection was that was not matched due to considerations regarding uh, anonymity, uh, wanting to have a survey be able to be transferred to paper-based surveys if uh, required, and relatively uh, low sample size within the first course, making uh, matching data difficult. Uh, this meant that it was difficult to ascertain whether the difference in responses were a result of the course delivery or instead were a result of a difference in uh, cohorts between courses. Uh, the feedback from yarning circles provided greater insight, which will be discussed on the next slide. So uh, just around the yarning circles, uh, feedback from the yarning circles indicated that the course was relevant to the attendees, which is uh, the main aim the course. However, there was clear room for improvement and ongoing improvement. Uh, so some of the feedback received within the yarning circles, uh, participants cited difficulties locating instructions for attending the online sessions. And I think we've all experienced that during COVID and uh, increasing uh, all our exposures to uh, online learning. Participants indicated that some content was not at the right level and that more inter introductory approach was of most value. Uh, so from the introduction and the pilot course, uh, now the clinical aspect of the course has gone to more of, a, of an introductory approach. Uh, participants valued case discussion and yarning with their peers and mentioning that presenters reading from slides was, was not engaging. And the survey was found to be intimidating including select questions, which could be viewed as assessing participant understanding uh, of the course content and culturally around, around shame. And so overall, the main theme from Yarning Circles, which participants felt very strongly about, was that the course needed to include increased discussion uh, with a focus around context and storytelling. Thanks, baby. Thanks, Adam. Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Um, yeah, so to respond to feedback, uh, Asham developed an alternative online registration approach that was found to be a bit easier to engage with. Uh, we engaged further reviewers to provide feedback on monitoring and evaluation methodology, which we'll discuss later in the presentation. We also engaged further clinical advisors to review the course, again, uh, including representative from the National Association of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Works and Practitioners. And that was really with more of a focus on scope of practice. And we engaged an Aboriginal health educator who had a focus on incorporating the Aboriginal eight ways of learning pedagogy. So this eight ways of learning pedagogy, which is really a, a method and a practice of teaching, uh, includes eight interconnected ways of learning, including story-based learning, as Adam already touched on, and something that the participants identified was a real uh, need for us to address or incorporate more, hands-on and reflective techniques, uh, contextualizing land links, community connectedness, use of symbols and metaphors, visual learning, uh, and a deconstruct, uh, reconstruct pedagogy where we have a focus on the whole as a group rather than um, like before splitting it up into smaller concepts and, and looking to, to reapply uh, knowledge land. So it's a very contextual way of learning and is focused really on more of a sharing way of learning and knowledge. Thanks, Phoebe. Uh, so we'll provide some, um, we'll break down some high level examples of how the course was adapted to align uh, with the eight ways of learning. So within that story sharing, and uh, Aboriginal learning is very contextual, uh, the course is now very much of a, that Western style approach of course delivery on slides. 
and also based around a, a yarning, a clinical yarning aspect. Uh, participants are continually encouraged to share their stories and experience, once again, drawing it back to community, back to experience and back to context. Uh, story and uh, learning context, like I just said, is, is paramount. A majority of content has been changed from that presentation style to open any questions uh, to the participants uh, and engaging from the very uh, get-go and also with a focus once again on, on community. Uh, throughout the course we reiterate that the attendees and facilitators all have experiences to share and the course is about learning from each other and not being the course presenter, the course facilitator, but having that sit down yarning everyone's learning everyone's knowledge has knowledge to uh, bring to the course and the connection to land at the beginning of the course we deliberately set aside 15 minutes of the course uh, so each person um, can outline the land they're from that land they're on and who their mob is to allow that yarning to take place between participants and, and facilitators around uh, connection to family skin groups where mob is at, where community is at. Community links, continually bringing back the story uh, to what the participant's role is, asking them how they'll use this info in their community and what barriers they may have in their own communities and learning maps, deconstruct, reconstruct. We cover Hep C as a whole at the beginning of the course before breaking it down into smaller topics. With the smaller topics, uh, we will consistently pull it back and consider specific scenarios for re reflection by attendees. Thanks, Phoebe. Thanks, Adam. So um, earlier we mentioned that the main theme from the yarning circle was the need for increased discussion, which Adam has also just really fleshed out um, in the last slide. And to have a reduction of text on slides and um, re really get away from our presentation style delivery. So when the course was uh, run again in June 21, 2021, um, for the first time since the pilot in six months, there was a greater emphasis on clinical yarning. Um, but that did come with an initial challenge, and this was particularly evident with online delivery, and that was that there was a very large amount of silence. So moving from presentation to more questions to the audience meant that there was a danger of participants not responding to questions. So to overcome this, we spoke to our facilitators and we, we brainstormed a little bit and determined that an appropriate approach would be to alter the way that we actually brief our presenters for online delivery. And that was telling them that it's really more of a discussion and encouraging them to jump in and uh, answer the questions themselves, to ask questions directly back to the other, um, the other presenters. And doing it in that way, let them get through all of the presenter notes and all of the required um, information, but doing it in a much more natural discussion focused way. And naturally, the seamless discussion uh, meant that participants were more likely to jump in themselves and felt more comfortable um, and sort of understood the way that the course was, was intended to run. Uh, as a result, we found that in our July sessions, um, we had very, um, very good uh, discussion and there were no awkward silences anymore, which was fantastic. Um, uh, back to Adam. And Adam, I'm just mindful of time, so we might yeah. try and push through a bit quickly. Yeah, sure. So there were just a number of uh, barriers uh, online, especially within the Aboriginal context, uh, that preference for Aboriginal people around that uh, communicate non-verbally, uh, not sharing of cameras makes non-verbal communication very difficult. Uh, some non-verbal uh, non communication cues, just like gestures and facial expressions used by uh, mob, um, have different meanings in Western contexts. This could be difficult to interpret online. Uh, we did attempt to overcome this by providing info in advance of the course, outlining that cameras on the day are encouraged and outlining how seeing each other positively impacts on cultural safety. Uh, presence and participation participation impacted. So work pressures, especially Aboriginal health workers being uh, not many and then having community uh, pressures taking time off work and then uh, time constraints. Maybe. Thanks, Adam. Um, so following the initial course, changes were made to the monitoring and evaluation methodology um, and these were really keeping online delivery in mind. So rather than using three time points for surveys, we moved to using one. 
uh, which reduce concerns related to non-matched data while still allowing for confidentiality and ensuring that if the course was delivered face-to-face -face, that uh, they can be translated face-to-face -face surveys. To allow this, we had to change the way questions were asked to put it back on participants to reflect on their own changes um, and outline if they did feel um, that they had change in level in confidences. Um, and any questions that which would, could be perceived as assessing understanding were removed completely. Uh, and just some, some of the findings briefly, we, which we found great, was 100% of the respondents from the 2021 course uh, either strongly agreed or agreed that confidence across the course's uh, competencies had improved. So that's a step towards breaking down barriers of Aboriginal people going to uh, seek medical care. And secondly, 100% of uh, respondents agreed or strongly agreed that they had a clear idea about how they would use that knowledge and skills from the course uh, going back into their communities and a lot of that around was around health education and reducing that shame within course uh, within community and importantly course facilitators demonstrated common cultural safety and I must emphasize that we're demonstrators uh, the, the facilitators uh, were very much culturally competent and I'll just skip this slide Phoebe and if you want to finish yeah up. Um, and we can talk about that in the conclusion. Yeah. So um, the pilot demonstrated the importance of, or that this course in general, are the importance of continuous quality improvement and providing adequate time following a pilot to make or implement changes. Uh, developing a course focused on discussion and storytelling and in line with the Aboriginal eight ways of learning, or at least just one example of Aboriginal ways of learning was key. And we recommend um, consulting with someone specializing in education for Aboriginal and Torres Islander peoples. Additionally, the course demonstrated the importance of co-designing programs um, and, um, and, and materials, evaluation methodologies with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Uh, the yarning circles or another form of qualitative discussion must be included um, to ensure that constructive feedback is received. What we didn't touch on is the fact that the yarning circles provide us with a lot of ways that we could potentially uh, change or make small changes to the course over time to improve the way that it can be delivered online and um, just in general the, the course materials. Um, to just summarise about online delivery, so for our cohort, the yarning circles outline that face-to-face -face delivery is preferred, but there is a place for online delivery and this course has allowed us to reach a broad range of, range of workers and our findings do show that while the preference is for face-to-face, Online is still well taken on um, and we had really fantastic evaluation findings. Um, and just lastly, yeah, if you would like to discuss anything in more detail, please email me, the email's there. I'm very sorry, I know that we've gone over time. Um, we did not mean to, I will pass back to Margaret and Troy. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Phoebe. Um, that's a really exciting piece of work and it was great to be involved in the development of that um, training package. And I guess it really highlights the important um, process of evaluating pro, um, programs within Aboriginal communities and, and really um, embedding that alternative um, process to improve training packages for our mob. So thank you very much for that. And um, just to try to catch up on some time, I'd like to introduce um, our next speaker, um, a colleague of mine here at the University of Queensland, um, Ms. Janet Stajic, um, and she'll be presenting um, today, representing the Institute of Urban Indigenous Health, and she'll be talking on overcoming barriers accessing hepatitis C, direct acting antiviral treatment in Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander primary health care, a continuous quality improvement approach. Please welcome Janet. Uh, I'll just put this presentation up, share screen. Okay. Okay, so um, yeah, I'd like to acknowledge the Gubby Gubby people of the Sunshine Coast region where I'm zooming in from today um, and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. My name's Janet Stadgick. I'm a Yudin Jujitable woman from far north Queensland. Um, I work as a research assistant for the Institute of Urban Indigenous Health or IUE on the project Overcoming Barriers to Accessing Hepatitis C direct acting antiviral treatment in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander primary health care, a continuous quality improvement approach. I'd also like to acknowledge our team members, um, Associate Professor Linda Selvey from the University of Queensland or UQ, 
And Ms. Renee Brown, Dr. Richard Mills and Dr. Lyle Turner of IUE. Today, I'll be providing an introduction and background to the project, the methodology, and some of the preliminary findings. Sorry, just trying to, there we go. Okay, so Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Services, or ATCHES, offer primary health care services controlled, run by and based in local Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. So these services aim to deliver holistic, comprehensive and culturally appropriate health care for the community and can therefore play a key role in hep C diagnosis and treatment for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. In Southeast Queensland, IUE leads the planning, development and delivery of primary health care through its member services shown here, including 20 associated clinics. Despite proactively providing hep C treatment to known and eligible clients, only about one third of these clients were found to be treated. IUE and UQ previously collaborated on the study Barriers and Enablers to Hep C Treatment Uptake among clients of ATCHES in Southeast Queensland, a qualitative inquiry. A key finding included healthcare workers describing a lack of knowledge related to Hep C and its treatment pointing to the need for increased comprehensive training for all ATCHES staff on how to best support clients to undertake screening and complete treatment. In July last year, before the project commenced, IUE implemented a Hep C campaign, which aimed to increase the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people receiving Hep C treatment in Southeast Queensland. The campaign was promoted on social media, radio, and via posters and brochures in Natchez clinics across the region. The main messages of the campaign were get tested, get treated, and treatment just got easier, with a key objective to raise awareness of hep C infection and treatment available. All GPs were offered training in how to investigate and treat suitable clients in primary care, and an IUE treatment protocol was developed and rolled out. So informed by the previous study, the overarching aim of this study was to increase the effectiveness of hep C specific CQI activities with relationship based peer coaching on hep C treatment within ATCHES in Southeast Queensland. The objectives were to assess the utility, acceptability and impact of incorporating into CQI activities, coaching and developing therapeutic relationships with clients, evaluate the role of CQI in improving hep C direct acting antiviral treatment and testing uptake in ATCHES and apply normalization theory process and tools to assess the level of normalization of hep C treatment in ATCHES prior to and during hep C specific CQI activities. Ethics approval was granted by the UQ Human Research Ethics Committee in December last year. So the theory underpinning this research was normalization process theory or NPT. It provided a useful framework to assist us in assessing the readiness to implement an intervention, progress in normalization of an intervention once it's been implemented and evaluate the impacts of interventions on the uptake of hep C testing and treatment. It was used throughout the life of the study, inspiring the research aims, informing data collection methods and used as a framework for data analysis. Standard continuous quality improvement or CQI processes are in place in all ATCHES across Southeast Queensland and involve routine one hour monthly meetings delivered by CQI facilitators. These meetings represent a commitment to transparent and collaborative ways of working, which are a practical manifestation of the ways statement, which is part of IUE's cultural integrity improvement framework. CQI meetings were identified as an appropriate forum to implement the two hep C interventions relating to this project, being the monitoring of hep C testing and treatment data and the delivery of relationship-based care coaching models, modules. So this study used mixed methods for the data collection. The quantitative methods include pre-intervention and post-intervention surveys and data monitoring, while the qualitative methods included evaluation forms from the coaching modules, as well as semi-structured interviews. 
Firstly, a link to the pre-intervention survey was sent to all participants, uh, participating member services staff. Um, the survey included questions about their own knowledge and confidence of hep C testing and treatment from the perspective of their roles. The two interventions were implemented into CQI activities over a seven month period, alternating monthly. During this time, three data monitoring sessions were held where participants participating clinics were presented with their hep C testing and treatment data to discuss how they, they can increase uptake for clients with risk factors and identify any barriers and supports needed. In the alternating months, three relationship-based care modules or yarning up modules as we call them, were delivered. Following each module, staff were sent a link to an evaluation form and asked to provide feedback. After the CQI intervention phase was complete, a post-intervention survey link was sent to all participating members, member services staff, which was a repeat of the pre-intervention survey designed to compare any change. Staff were also invited to participate in a semi-structured interview to provide a deeper insight into their experiences of the interventions and any impact on practice. Okay, so this chart gives you an overview of the project timeline and the data collection phases. Uh, the pink squares show the pre-intervention and post-intervention surveys. The orange squares show the data monitoring sessions, which were planned for March, May and July, as well as a fourth extraction at the end of October for the purpose of data analysis. Uh, the blue squares show the yarning up modules one, two and three scheduled for April, June and August. And the teal box shows the semi-structured interviews which are currently being undertaken in November and December. So here I'll share the pre preliminary results of the pre-intervention survey and the evaluation of the yarning up modules. So we had 62 survey respondents working in a variety of roles across southeast Queensland. The majority worked in clinical roles where they where they're likely to be able to speak to directly speak directly with clients about Hep C treatment. Most respondents scored themselves low in their familiarity of Hep C treatment. Over half didn't consider Hep C treatment to be part of their normal work. Generally, staff had limited understandings of ways of working with Hep C treatment, how it affected their work, its purpose and value. There was a sense that staff saw Hep C treatment as someone else's or the expert's responsibility and that they were willing to play a part but weren't sure how. Only 38% believed that sufficient staff training was provided to enable Hep C treatment, and just over half believed that management adequately supported Hep C treatment. 60% were open to offering Hep C treatment and just over half believed it could easily be integrated into their work. 72% said they thought about the WAYS statement when interacting with clients. 63% said they incorporated the WAYS into everything they do at work. And 65% believed that incorporating the WAYS improved relationships with clients. So the yarning up modules delivered were You Make Me Sick, which was about valuing client autonomy. Uh, the second one, Proper Yarns, um, Appreciating Cultural Ways of Communicating. And the third one, Shame Job, um, Understanding and Dismantling Stigma to Break Down Barriers. We received 28 evaluation forms for the three yarning up modules. Most respondents found the modules to be an eye opener and reported increased understandings. In particular, the cultures and history of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and the historical and ongoing impact of colonisation, which helped them to better understand the barriers Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people experience in accessing appropriate health care and the importance of ACHES providing this care. They also had increased knowledge of hep C treatment and how much easier it is now. Respondents learnt how to better support clients in relation to hep C testing and treatment by understanding differences, being open-minded and non-judgmental, using effective and culturally safe communication, building relationships, trust and respect, being adaptable and collaborating with other staff. 
They mention other ways to improve practice, such as by increased phone follow-up with clients, treating clients as individuals and enabling client autonomy. There was also a great willingness from respondents to take ownership, continue their own learning journey and to use reflection as a method to continuously evaluate their own as well as collective practices and procedures within their services. Respondents also mentioned awareness of their own biases and breaking down barriers to clients undertaking and completing treatment. Staff enjoyed the interactive learning environment with the opportunity to learn from each other, particularly their Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander co-workers. The discussions promoted inf insightful conversations and valued staff valued the group's diversity of age, background and experience. They described the content of the modules as great, informative, relevant and necessary, very interesting and a difficult but very important topic. Many found the experience emotionally challenging and expressed feeling exhausted, sad, ashamed, disheartened, uncomfortable, distressed, emotional, angry and confronted through learning about and visiting and revisiting the past. Well, some said it motivated them to focus on positive change for the present and future. Others described feeling good, great, positive, satisfied, great, grateful, and appreciated the open and supportive team environment. One respondent was not sure what they'd do with what they'd learned, but said that the discussion will resonate with them for some time. Okay, so in summary, the pre-intervention survey revealed a concerning lack of staff knowledge and confidence in hep C testing and treatment, but also identified areas of need, particularly in staff training, better support and resources. So it'll be very interesting to analyse and compare the post-intervention survey results once the survey closes at the end of this month. The Yarning Up modules evaluation provided us with feedback that the modules were well received and found to be informative and beneficial. They also showed a shift in staff members thinking and perceptions of hep C and how they both individually and collaboratively could improve both clients' experiences and potentially the uptake of hep C testing and treatment. We're looking forward to completing all of the interviews um, to further explore the impact of the CQI interventions and analyze this data. We're also in the process of analysing the hep C testing and treatment data for each participating member service across the four data extraction periods to monitor any change in uptake. The overall analysis is due to be undertaken next year. So if you'd like more information, um, yeah, please jot down my email and um, yeah, send me an email. Be great. Thank you. Thanks very much, Janet, for a really interesting um, a presentation, a really interesting um, project, which um, I think we've got a lot, you know, we're going to learn a lot from that as well as um, thinking about what, you know, Phoebe and Adam talked about as well um, about the education we need to do. So thank you so much for that. And I look forward to um, hearing a little bit more in the panel discussion. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to move on to our, our next speaker, which is Esha Layton from Quinn. Um, and she's going to be talking with us about an Aboriginal peer-based project and model of service delivery and the role peers can play in integrated point of care testing in outreach services in Southeast Queensland. So over to you. Uh, welcome and over to you, Esha. Thank you very much. So I would like to start with some barrier key points when it comes to um, testing people with, um, sorry, testing people for hep C. So one of the main key points is fear. Um, their fear about having hep C and getting the results and getting tested. Fear about the treatment because they've heard so much about the old treatment and the side effects and what people went through. The stigma and discrimination issues, even if it's internal within yourself, because most people who inject drugs have dealt with being discriminated in their lives. And when it happens to you once, it feels like it happens all the time. Also, there is so much stigma. And when it comes to people who inject drugs, um, there's more stigma than any, anything else, even if it comes to the news, TV shows, and even in the whole world. Healthcare staff, most people who inject drugs have never had a good experience with any healthcare staff, even if it's hospitals, doctors, blood collectors, prison staff, et cetera. 
embarrassment, embarrassment about their veins if they don't have, like if they do have vein issues or letting people even know that they inject or show their track marks. So when you consider all these points I've spoken about, um, this is what happens with people who inject drugs. I was and still am one of those people and have dealt with all these things. As you know, my name is Isha Layden and I'm a peer harm reduction worker at Quinn. I've lived with hep C for around about 20 years before doing the treatment. Also, when it came to getting tested and treated for hep C, I have to say it was quite scary. I had fears about the results. I was embarrassed about getting tested because of my bad vein ex, um, access and dealing with stigma and discrimination, which a lot um, I've dealt with a lot in a lot of different health in a lot of different settings, such as healthcare settings. A lot has changed since I was tested and treated. One great thing that has happened is the wonderful point of care machines. With the point of care machine, it's a uh, 50 minutes and you get your test results. It's a prick of the finger. It's quite easy. There's no stress for our clients. And the best thing about the point of care machine is that it can go on outreach and it's most, most point of care machines are in our um, needle and syringe um, offices at Quinn. In, for example, Townsville, Sunshine Coast, Brisbane and Gold Coast. But that's not all that's wonderful. Um, the other wonderful thing is, is about peer workers like myself um, that can do the hep C testing and use the point of care machines. So all our hep C peer workers at Quinn have been trained to conduct testing and give people the results. As a peer worker, we also support our clients on treatment for hep C and support and case management. Clients come to speak to someone just like themselves um, about getting tested, treated, and we use a peer-led approach and service. As a peer worker, we have lived experience with injecting drug use, having hep C, doing the hep C treatment, having talk about our own experiences of doing treatment, have been to jail, we share the same language and we have empathy. Okay, let's just start together. So um, we also, we place the client as an expert in their own life. So the great thing as a peer worker is that we do the point of care testing. We give the client the results. We build great rapport. We make the, feel, the client feel um, comfortable. And generally, we want to help our clients because um, we have been there ourselves. There's no stigma and discrimination either. So for the last two years at Quinn, we've employed a First Nations Hep C peer worker. They have done such a great job engaging with our clients and services that we don't work with a lot, a lot before. David, our current First Nations peer worker, has been doing hep C point of care testing for about four months and has been to places like supporting housing, um, worked over at Micra at West End and has been out on the Quinn Social Outreach Services, connecting with clients and having a lot of discussions about hep C testing and options. We've also been doing point of care testing at Anala Indigenous Health Service, where we can connect with people with the GP and nurse at the services. The response from the clients and getting the uh, fingerprint test at these services has been great. Since we started doing hep C point of care, testing in November last year, we've got results of 572 people with 28 of those people tested have been identified as Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander with 8% of um, HCV detected. We've done, such, we've done some target testing at places such as Sunshine Coast in, Indigenous Well Person Health Check Day and collaborated with um, um, Aboriginal men medical service at Nambour to test the patients in a blitz point of care testing. Bringing our lift experience to the point of care testing process has been really valuable. At Quinn, we, we under half the point, I'm sorry, at Quinn, just under half of the point of care testing has done by us as peers and, or people with lived experience. This is in the area that we need more dedicated funding so that we continue to do our great work in our services and community where clients don't have don't access our service or know about Quinn and know about that peers do the work. Thank you. Thank you very much for that.
great presentation, Isha, and um, I really say, I've um, got to say, I really love the work that Quinn do up here in southeast Queensland and across the state. Um, and and I'd just like to reiterate as well that um, the position you spoke about, David's um, position, the Aboriginal peer worker there, um, funding will, will come to an end at the end of the year, and we, we really need to find some funding to keep this type of work happening because it really have a huge impact in regards to um, testing and treating and linking, linking our mob to care. So thank you very much for that. Um, our next presentation is um, Miss Erin Flynn from the University of Queensland and Dr. Sirachi um, Amarasina from Walhalla Aboriginal Health Service. Um, they'll be presenting on the strategies for hepatitis C testing and treatment in Aboriginal communities that lead to elimination, um, known as the Scale C study. Please welcome Erin and Dr. Sue. Thanks, Troy. Sorry, I'll just try and get it. Presentation. Yeah, look good. Okay, so yeah, with myself and Dr. Aaron Messina are going to present on the Scale C study, which is strategies for hepatitis C testing and treatment in Aboriginal communities that lead to elimination. And before I start, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners uh, and their custodianship on the lands which we meet on today and I'm presenting here from Ghana land and Ghana country. And I want to pay my respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connection to country and recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So I'm just going to provide an overview of the scale C study, present some very or some kind of interim results. The study doesn't actually finish probably until halfway through next year. Um, and then Sue's going to provide some lessons learned. So the study is led by Professor James Ford from the University of Queensland and Dr. Marianne Martinello is the medical monitor and the mother CEO of the study from the Curve Institute. Our funding is provided by an MHM, NHMRC project grant, uh, which finishes up next year. Our four partners are Rekindling the Spirit in Lismore, Port Lincoln Aboriginal Health Service, Wahola Aboriginal Corporation in Tamworth, and Pangula in Afghanistan. We have ethics from both Aboriginal health councils in New South Wales and South Australia, and St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney. And just on the map, that's where our four sites are located. So the design of the study is a prospective cohort study. Uh, the population is people with or at risk of hep C, and that's defined as injecting drug use, incarceration, or recipient of opioid substitution therapy in 12 months from screening. And the study is set within the Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Services. And the intervention is a community-based test and treat hepatitis C model of care. Our primary endpoint is the change in hepatitis C prevalence and incidence within the study cohorts with those with recent risk factors for hepatitis C. And then we've got some secondary objectives looking at treatment uptake, phylogenetics, and the barriers and enablers to hepatitis C care. And I should say there is a sub-study, a qualitative sub-study that is underway looking at that last objective. Overall, the study aims to provide rapid testing for hep C, a single visit diagnosis, and then access to the new and improved treatment for those that test positive. So the study is set in primary care. Um, it's led by a nurse or Aboriginal health practitioner. It involves point of care, linguistic testing for hep C and also hep B and HIV. Non-invasive liver fibrosis assessment with fibro scan, linkage to care and immediate initiation of DAAs if someone tests positive and it's clinically appropriate. At the population level, this is a treatment as prevention strategy. So once someone enters the health service, they're consented for the study, they're then provided with a tablet, which um, has a single question risk assessment that they can do confidentially. Based on that, based on how they answer that question, which we'll go into the next slide, they are provided or offered a HCV antibody point of care test or a HCV RNA test. For those that meet the study cohort criteria, they go on to complete a survey about risk behaviours. 
They also offered a liver fibrosis assessment as the fibre scan is available. And at the end of the visit, they get a study T-shirt and a $20 Coles voucher. And for those that test positive, they're seen by a GP and hopefully initiated on the treatment. So in terms of the screening, so someone provides informed consent, the tablet asks a question um, along the lines of, do you have a current hepatitis C or a past hepatitis C infection? Or history of interjecting drug, interjecting drug use, incarceration, or OST? For those that answer yes, they go straight. They're offered the HCV RNA test and we've been expert, and those are say no or prefer not to say uh, offered a HCV antibody test. If someone tests positive on the antibody test, they go on to have that no test. In terms of treatment, um, there are two treatments we're using, both under the PBS prescribing and three under closed gap, um, both pension typic. Um, the treatments are not dictated by the study. That's purely up to the GP providing care and discussion with the patient. And just here's the material we produced at the start of the study, posters and the t-shirt. Okay, so as of a couple of weeks ago, we've had 465 people consent to the study and complete the screening questionnaire. Of those, 49% said they were not at risk and had an um, HCV antibody test, all of which were negative. So I think this further supports the use of risk-based screening and testing. Of those that identified risk factor, so that's any risk factor, historic risk factor or current, 18% um, tested HCV RNA positive. And out of the 239 that identified any current or historic risk factor, 193 had a risk factor in the previous 12 months of screening and were enrolled in the Scout City cohort. And I should say the cohort, the original plan of the study is that the cohort followed longitudinally um, and engaged um, like six month periods for retesting, but this has been incredibly difficult and I think more challenging with COVID. In terms of the demographics of our cohort, the mean age is 36 years and we don't see much difference between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and Indigenous. And I should say that the study was focused on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people but um, non-Indigenous people receiving care at our partner sites that we were also able to study. Most of our participants were male and most were from New South Wales and this is just purely because of the size of the population. So our New South Wales sites are Lismore and Tamworth to regional hubs and then in SA the smaller towns. The most common risk reported risk factor was a history of injecting drug use and incarceration. And 35% reported a current or past hepatitis infection. Of those that reported any risk factor, I'm sorry, this 218 is slightly different for the screening slide I presented because this was extracted back in October. So of the 200, of the 218, 202 were able to uh, have a HCV RNA test. Um, 40 of those tested positive, so prevalence of just nearly 20%. Again, we didn't see much difference between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander participants and non-Indigenous participants. Um, and then higher prevalence among those that reported current injecting drug use or ever been um, both substitution therapy. But all in all, the prevalence that we've seen in this study is similar to studies in other settings, um, people with risk factors for hepatitis C. In terms of the cascade of care, so as of a few weeks ago, we had 239 people with any historic risk factor and had a HCV RNA test. Of those, 42 tested positive. And less than half went on to commence treatment. 
of those who commenced treatment, we've only had three participants have a SVR12 test and be, I guess, clinically cured of hepatitis C. Um, so as you can see here, we've had quite a lot of people drop off at different stages of the cascade of care. I'm just going to hand over to Sue to discuss some of our lessons so far. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Sue, a GP from uh, Gamilar Island, and I'm going to talk to you about the lessons learned and the challenges we faced during last two and a half years uh, uh, during this study. Uh, we have roughly uh, divided this into three parts, and I like to start with uh, treatment and follow up. But before I go there, I just want to uh, stress upon a couple of factors. Uh, so I've, we've seen that there is a lot of uh, stigma around uh, bloodborne viruses. And so there is a need for optimi optimizing model of care and service delivery to increase testing, treatment uptake, and promote ongoing care, healthcare engagement. And this is where we have identified the you know, um, Aboriginal health workers, Aboriginal health practitioners, and other support workers play come into role, and we have uh, seen the importance of it, ongoing importance of their input. And um, there is a big gap between the diagnosis and uh, and the uh, treatment, and only 50% of patients diagnosed with Hep C has have commenced the treatment. Uh, I think Janet and uh, Isha uh, stressed on uh, overcoming barriers. Um, so my my experience is if we could give uh, if we could start testing and offer the treatment on on the same day, which we call it as one stop shop um, uh, model, where a person comes in, uh, we test them through point of care testing. And we do the necessary um, uh, assessments for suitability for uh, the treatment and offer them the treatment on the same day. There's been more success. So um, that's what I have highlighted in the one uh, stop uh, shop. And uh, uh, it's something that we could look into as AMSs in future. And um, we have uh, identified good uh, GP. Uh, pharmacy relationship in this and it has proved a lot of benefit. So our local pharmacy does uh, do Webster packing uh, for our patients uh, from eight to 12 weeks, depending on the medication. And they have agreed to deliver the Webster packs to the patients. And uh, when they're delivering, they, they check on the patient's compliance and they report back to us. And uh, this is again, something that we can look into and uh, build upon uh, looking at the barriers. And um, uh, follow-up has become, organizing follow-ups ha uh, has become challenging as most of our patients in the high-risk cohort, cohort don't have proper contact details. Either they you know, lose the phone, uh, lose their phone number, or you know, they, they migrate from one place to the other. So follow-up has become a, a bit of a challenge, especially to, uh, you know, test for SVR, whether, uh, and every six monthly uh, for their point of care testing. Um, and uh, coming to point of care testing, so this has uh, significantly changed the management of hepatitis C. Um, and only uh, there are a couple of things around a point of care testing. Um, it requires uh, trained staff, um, and uh, there's then uh, there needs to be a technical uh, support, ongoing uh, technical support for calibrating, updating data uh, uh, for the machine, and uh, there, there there needs uh, new staff, trained staff. Uh, to do the uh, point of care testing. And uh, uh, the next one is the community engagement. And this is where our Aboriginal health workers and Aboriginal health practitioners has a big uh, 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 role to play in. And um, I'm finally coming down to uh, how uh, COVID has impacted our study. Uh, we had to stop the study for a couple of months. We had to uh, stop people coming into the clinic 
for needle syringe program. We had to take uh, the, the equipments uh, outside and distribute it. Um, and uh, after introduction of the uh, COVID-19 vaccine, things have started changing. So people have, we have started uh, seeing uh, patients face to face, uh, especially when they come for vaccine, we, we offer them hepatitis C screening. And if they come for the screening, we offer them uh, uh, the, the uh, hep C uh, uh, screening. So um, I'm just uh, uh, leaving with one question here. Uh, that is, where is the best place for Aboriginal people to seek hepatitis C care and treatment? So my personal uh, you know, uh, experience, it could be anywhere. It could be your GP, it could be your liver clinic, it could be your AMS or a other uh, private clinic where the patient feel comfortable. So I think as healthcare workers, our main duty is to uh, build that comfortable place. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sue and Erin. Um, I think, in um, due to time, we might move on to our final speaker, if that's okay. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce um, Scott Monaghan, who is the CEO of the Balgamanaru Medical Aboriginal Corporation, um, who's going to uh, tell us about really launching the BBV and STI program in regional Aboriginal medical services, a partnership approach with EC Australia and ASHAM. Scott, it's uh, lovely to have you speak with us today. Good afternoon, Margaret. Thank you. I'd just like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners on the lands we meet on today, the Bunjalung people, um, elders past and present, and also um, uh, fellow Aboriginal um, 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 colleagues online today. Just to give you a bit of an up overview of Bolganaru. So we're a, um, I suppose, a, a service that started about 31 years ago in Grafton. Um, we now have uh, five separate clinics across, spanning from Grafton, McLean, Casino, um, into Tweed Heads. We've got a, a um, out of home care service as well in Grafton. Um, we've got about 91 full time equivalent staff. Of that staffing um, ratio, there's about 18 GPs, uh, 18 GPs across our footprint. Um, but the multi -disciplinary, disciplinary teams that we have consist of dental services, um, mental health um, practitioners, um, psychologists, psychiatrists, Aboriginal health workers um, who What's been mentioned here today is central to a lot of the work we do, drug and alcohol workers, um, exercise physiologists, um, youth services, and as I mentioned before, the out-of-home service. Uh, we service um, about six um, discrete Aboriginal communities that are, um, would be considered um, remote for the uh, northern rivers of New South Wales. Um, our client base is around about 10,000 active clients across those, um, those services. So um, we have a diverse range of uh, client base um, across our sector, um, but the, the project that we've um, entered into with EC Australia and the Burnett Institute, Institute and um, ASHAM really came about after being contacted by Troy um, about the middle of last year. Um, and when the, the topic of um, um, uh, submitting for federal uh, funding to roll out a um, hep C program, um, you know, it really caught my attention because Grafton, um, as coined by the local um, politician here, is a, 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 a jail town. Um, we've always had a correctional facility in the in the town, and um, 18 months ago, um, um, Circo opened a, an 1,800-bed facility. So we we could see there was going to be a real need to have um, you know, a solid foundation for testing in our clinics. Um, historically, BB, BBV and STI. Um, um, testing and support was funded out of the state government, but that, 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 that type of funding ended about five years ago. So as like most AMSs, we operate in a, almost a siloed model, uh, dependent on funding. Um, and once the, um, the funding was um, rolled back from the, from the state government, um, the, the need or the testing around those, that particular program um, sort of fell off. So, when we were approached about this program and then we were successful in it, you know, we we're really, really excited um, to be able to, I suppose, build back into our normal um, core, core daily business um, with our GPs, our uh, clinical team, our community, um, and just our um, allied health workers in general around the need for, uh, for testing, for community awareness, um, 
but just the um, the opportunity to bring this back and back to the uh, center of our uh, or back to our core core business in our, in our clinical team was um, was you know, really um, bought with uh, um, a lot of a lot of joy from our clinical teams. Um, we've established a um, an advisory committee um, um, for or for the um, for this program. Um, that's really led by um, Asham and um, EC Australia. So that consists of a number of GPs across our site, um, health workers, um, uh, some nurse, some some of our nursing staff are really really keen on this on this program. Um, but you know, um, for us, it's um, really um, bringing this back to the centre um, around that education and opportunity to work with the community, but also work with um, um, with with people in the community that have tested positive. Um, we also work with the local health district to um, to support this program as well. So um, you know, we really um, um, th take this opportunity to thank Troy and the team at AC Australia for uh, supporting us in this process. Um, and you know, getting us out of that siloed model and back into that um, a process of a holistic care um, that will be able to support the community holistically in this, this approach uh, to eliminate it um, and to provide awareness to, to our community. So thanks, Troy. Uh, thank you very much, Scott. And um, here at EC Australia and also at Ashland, we're excited to be partnering with an Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Service. Um, what I couldn't coin, you know, the one of the, the preferred providers of Aboriginal health on the, you know, within New South Wales and especially on the North Coast there. So um, it's going to be exciting, especially partnering with the um, workforce and the, the multidisciplinary team that will be working with up there. So we look forward to that and um, and really getting some good evaluation out of that and looking at the scalability of this project uh, to be rolled out in other areas. So um, before um, we go any further, I'd like to reintroduce Margaret. Margaret's going to chair the panel. Um, I know that we've gotten a little bit behind in time here. Um, so we'll try and catch some time up and um, get everyone out of here on time. So um, welcome back, Margaret Hellard. Thanks, Troy. And if the panel members could um, turn on their um, cameras for the audience, that would be, be lovely. Um, can I just say uh, thank you all for fabulous presentations. It's been super interesting to hear. Um, we've only really got a short amount of time. So I'm going to... Um, Really, Greg, thanks for the, the, the data that was presented. And there's two things, that, there were many things that cro crossed my mind, but two things really stood out for me um, that were very different within um, differences in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community compared to the, the non-Indigenous community. One was around harm reduction and the other was around, um, whilst testing was good, that there seemed to be a slower uptake of treatment. And I'm just gonna ask the panel, I don't mind, I'm gonna say, um, maybe I'll start with the, um, harm reduction one first and ask people what they think, um, why they think this might happen. And it's really simple sort of brief answers, but also I know we've struggled often to have Atchises have harm reduction services within the Atchis and what might be ways forward to help Atchises be able to do this. Um, Scott, as a person that leads this, I'm gonna go back your way as the person that spoke last, just to think about that and whether you've got any thoughts and then pass it on to other panel members for a really quick comment on that. I think just the opportunity to have um, a, um, a program like this uh, in, um, within the HO sector, or just to have it on the agenda with the clinical staff and with administration staff, but the staff in general um, would, would go a long way to um, harm reduction, but also bring to the fore um, issues that are in the community. Um, so I think anything that can can um, start the narrative within the community, particularly um, within our clinical team, because as I mentioned before, a lot of our work is done in a siloed model. It's funded from the Commonwealth Government or the State Government, and we really have to work to the themes of those. So if there's an opportunity to bring this, um, um, you know, as part of normal business, and that's what I would say is that if it could become part of normal business, it would make it a lot easier um, and it would make it a lot more accessible for um, community to access um, services that would you know, reduce harm um, and um, provide opportunity for them to come forward and be tested. Janet, I might ask you, because Scott raised this issue of normal, normal business and you talked about normalisation in your talk and then over to you, Esher, I think I'll go. Uh, Janet, if you'd like to comment on, again, just thinking about this harm reduction issue first up, we'll go back to the treatment link, but and then Esher and then others. But Janet? 
You're on mute, Janet. Janet, you're on mute. Sorry. Um, yeah, I might just pass on that one because I I think that's a question for Dr. Richard Mills um, within the team. Um, sure. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure on what... what no worries. Not a problem. Esha, would you like to comment on perhaps Greg, even though I know it's the uh, um, Australian Indian Syringe Program survey, which Lisa runs, but Esha, Greg, and then others jump in if you want to. Yeah, I think um, a harm reduction. I think if doctors and healthcare staff brought out a bit more um, education or even spoke about spoke to their clients about harm reduction strategies, it would make it a bit more normalising for a client to come in and start talking to the doctor instead of like having, um, say, injuries or something like that and not feeling comfortable to go to a doctor. So I think if they started talking more about harm reduction strategies and more about harm reduction instead of not to use, it would um, make it a bit more normalised and make clients come in more. Was that the question? Sorry. In, in part. And yeah. yeah. So that, yeah. That, that, okay. that, but I think, I, no, I think it highlights the issue of, again, the normalisation and, and like, Greg, Phoebe, Erin, would you like to comment on this? Um, I suppose from my perspective, not, not being a harm reductionist per se, but I think it's somewhat similar to sort of hep C treatment access in the sense we need flexibility and greater access points. Uh, and we need you know, strategies that are built you know, for the community. Um, and I think we also have been a little bit obsessed with hep C in terms of focusing on you know, treatment, uptake and... Uh, and look, encouraging reductions in hep C RNA prevalence, but we should take uh, this absolutely as seriously in terms of you know, uh, strategies to reduce uh, harmful injecting. And, and that has to be a priority within the, within the broader context, but also within the hep C context. Erin and Phoebe, I'm gonna make your life a little bit more difficult when I'm gonna ask this question, because I'm gonna give a, a story that I heard was part of work that when I was doing work uh, in North Richmond with an outbreak of HIV amongst um, Indigenous communities and people who are injecting drugs. And Erin, I think it sort of plays a little Phoebe to one of the kind of aspects you brought up in presentation about a cultural issues around injecting and actually that there were sort of cultural components to sharing of injecting equipment um, that were brought up within that mob. Um, and I'm wondering whether in your education work, Phoebe, around culturally specific practices around hepatitis C harm reduction testing and treatment, whether that's come up at all for you or an Erin, I'd be really interested with scale C, whether that's also come up at all. Phoebe? Yes, and then um, absolutely, it has. There are a lot of conversations around uh, the fact that, well, we have a lot of conversations firstly around why there is a disproportionate burden. Um, and as we all know, there are many reasons, including a lot of systemic inequities. But in terms of sharing equipment, um, you know, feedback that we've heard from our workers who are, who are attending our course is that there is more of a focus on sharing and, um, and, and that can lead to, of course, increased transmission. Um, in terms of your earlier question around, uh, you know, NSPs being incorporated or uh, anything around shame, we've heard a lot of people who attend our course who say that they might not personally feel that, um, that, these, that these topic areas um, should be stigmatizing, but that they may avoid asking questions because they don't want their clients to feel shame. And so I think just to Isha's point around normalizing, if we can get NSP services um, to be the norm, if we can get BUV and STI testing to be normal questions that are just included as part of 715s or as part of any consultation, I think that'll go a really long way to breaking down stigma, discrimination, feelings of shame and community. Um, and in terms of just NSPs and how they can work with art shows, not to name any art shows, but we do know of a couple who have um, gone to great lengths to actually incorporate NSP services into their models. And they found that they're a, they've been able to increase their testing um, and it's led to some really great conversations because you can say we have an NSP service here or they can talk about harm reduction and it makes their clients feel a bit less shame um, and a bit more open to having those discussions that they may not be normally. Thanks, Phoebe. Erin, your thoughts here? And then I'm going to go straight back to you with another question around treatment. I might actually pass over to Sue for this one because there's a wall hollow has quite an amazing NSP integrated into their service. Um, yeah. So we have an NSP in our clinic. Uh, as I mentioned, the stigma is the big uh, issue accessing the NSP. So uh, we have made our patients, uh, you know, aware that you can 
you can come uh, anytime uh, and, and make them comfortable. Uh, so uh, even during the pandemic, even when we were closed and we were not having patients coming into our clinic, still our patients who uh, needed, uh, you know, clean uh, syringes, uh, they, they still came and asked uh, for them. So I think we have established that. That's by uh, having a discussion that this is uh, what we are trying to do is harm reduction and uh, you can have the access uh, to uh, clean equipment anytime. So I think, Thanks. yeah. Thanks, Sue. My next question, I'm just really conscious of time and I feel terrible that we're rushing this panel discussion and um, we will make sure when we do a future one of these, which we do every year, it'll be a longer panel discussion. I, the thing that stood out for me is testing seems to be okay. I mean, I think the point of care testing is fantastic but there is this drop off between that and the proportion of people from um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities starting treatment. Um, and Erin, even in your work where you're really working hard to do this, it was only 50% capture. Um, there's lots of reasons why, but do you think there's any specific reasons why or what we need to be trying to work harder on to get better at that? And then I'll throw that open to the panel. I think maybe the qualitative study will unpack this a bit more, but I think Sue touched on it. It really, what we see needs to be a one-stop shop. So the point of care testing and really leaving with a script or, I, you know, even leaving with a medication even better because we've found it really hard, even those that have started treatment, even coming back, you know, we don't know if they've filled additional scripts, completed treatment. Um, yeah, so this kind of one-stop shop model, maybe other kind of peers, ongoing peer support, something like that. Yeah, Esha, would you, Esha, Esha, thoughts on that and then and then others? Yeah, so at Queen, we do offer peer support right through their treatment. So from their first consultation with our nurse practitioner, <coughs> um, even just before that, booking the clients in um, to the end. But we do feel that there's, there is a drop sometimes and we do lose the clients. Um, I think, Erin, what you're suggesting would be marvellous, like a one-stop shop where not just get scripted but have the medication with them. You know, that would be um, wonderful in an ideal world because, like, we still give the clients a script and we still pay for the script, but if the client, there's, you know, a lot can happen from when you, they walk out the door with that script to get to that chemist and then they'll forget about the script, lose the script, catch up with people. So I think, Erin, what you're suggesting to have a one-stop shop is um, get tested, get, treat, like, get um, treated and have the medication as they walk out the door would be marvellous. Thanks. I'm just really conscious of the time. Does anybody want to make a specific extra comment on that from the panel members? Uh, Margaret, I didn't present it, but we did uh, look at sort of the time to RNA testing amongst people that were diagnosed. And there's, there's definitely a delay in terms of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, people, at least within the New South Wales linkage. So I think the point of care testing, look, it's not a solution to everything, uh, but I think it will help. And if we can roll out uh, a large sort of network of sites that can get people screened quickly, get them linked to the care, support them with peer-based uh, workers as well, I think will go a long way to enhancing uh, uptake. And Isha, to your point, and something to explore, I know that say Alex Thompson in the um, safe injecting facility in, in Richmond, um, for that group uh, of, of people, um, they got the pharmacy to send the medication there. So those things can be affected. I'd love to keep this conversation going, but we can't. So I'm going to hand it to th thank the panel um, and hand it to you, Troy, to, um, to, to, to finish us off, please. Uh, thank you, Margaret. And I'd just like to say a big thank you to all of our presenters here today um, and, our, um, and Margaret for, for being my co-host. Um, and this brings us to, I guess, the end of our um, BC Australia's webinar series is a final webinar for 2021. Um, so in the, I guess, considering time, um, I'll finish up now and just um, like to say thank you to everyone and thank you to all the attendants that made today possible as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>